The next talk is the other side, is mobile. And uh, so when we were at Engineer, we used to talk about this all the time. What are we doing for mobile? And, um, and it's tricky because the answer is, well, nothing. You know, we run, <laughs> we run the back end. Um, as close as we ever really, you know, and perhaps you know, they're better at it now, but this is some of the early thoughts we had was, well, nothing. Um, what was interesting is the language changed. You know, if your customer was a mobile developer, they didn't refer to the, you know, to the to as a web app, they just called the back end. It was like, it's, you know, the, the word app had been taken and given to the mobile part of it, and the other part was not that valued. But then it's still left with, I like Ruby, so what are my options? And if you've ever written Objective-C, you're probably back writing web apps. Um, because <laughs> it's C, I, for the first time in 10 years, I got a linking error. And I thought, that's right. That shouldn't, you know, this is the 21st century. I shouldn't do this. Um, so the next talk is actually going to give you an idea of what your option is. You like Ruby. You want to do mobile development. Let's look at Ruby Motion. Please put your hands together for Brian Sandbrodden. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, we spent about six or seven hours in the Philadelphia airport. And uh, I'm wearing something from the Rome airport. So, but we got here. So I'm going to talk about iOS games with Ruby Motion and Joybox. And for the longest time, I had this envy of iOS developers. I really wanted to make iOS apps. But then I look at Objective-C, and my eyes start to bleed. <laughs> Until somebody rescued me with Joybox. So first of all, I'm super happy to be here after the trials and tribulation of getting here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I am BS Bowden on Twitter. I've been writing code since H9 in a multiplicity of languages. Rubyist since 05, running a consultancy since 02. And a good segue here is that I actually write business applications on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not a gamer, and I don't write games. I do now. And I ate a 35-pound, uh, 35-ounce <laughs> steak, not recently. So that's one of my life achievements. <laughs> so let's talk about Ruby Motion. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Ruby Motion? All right, excellent. So Ruby Motion, again, it's a way for us to be able to write iOS applications and Mac applications using the language that we love using the practices that we love, and testing, which is one of those things that you will rarely see in an iOS application. So Lauren Samsonetti put this uh, framework together. He's the creator of Mac Ruby, and he did an amazing job creating something that is concise enough to get to the point. How many of you are Objective-C developers? OK, I apologize for the insults in advance. <laughs> Objective-C hurts my eyes. It is a magnificent language. It has uh, a heritage of small talk, which uh, I think Paolo uh, spoke about why small talk you know, didn't make it. Um, but I think part of it, it's the visual aspects of small talk. It's a magnificent language. Objective-C has, it's the, the child of C, C++, and small talk. But I don't like it. You know, it's a personal preference, but I don't like it. The, the, the major thing that I don't really like, though, it's the community practices. They don't see code beauty as Rubyists do. And that's one of the things that drove me uh, towards the Ruby community, the fact that we want the code to look beautiful. And it's, it's an ephemeral type of thing. It's, it's hard to describe what beautiful code is, but when you see it, you know it. So Ruby Motion, it's a commercial with some source available a Ruby-based tool chain for iOS. That means that it will create Objective-C, it will create binaries that you can deploy to the App Store. It's based on Mac Ruby, um, targets iOS and the Mac platform, compile binaries. There's no uh, code manipulation at runtime. So a lot of the things that we're used to doing in Ruby, you can do. Uh, heavy metaprogramming, you have to pre-plan a lot of the things that you do, but you do have the Ruby syntax at hand. And Ruby motion applications can be deployed to the App Store, which is, that was the, the, the pinnacle point where we said, yes, 
I can write Ruby, and I can actually make money out of iOS applications made with Ruby. There is a very large, growing community of gems. Ruby Motion gems have to be specifically made for Ruby Motion because they have to follow all the rules that the iOS Objective-C under a line infrastructure needs to follow. So Rubyists are making iOS apps. One of the first ones that got uh, popularity and not notoriety out there is uh, Basecamp. Basecamp seems to have done really well in the mobile uh, form. Also, uh, Jukli, it's a, a music-related application that has done very well. And uh, Lines is actually a beautiful application for the uh, underground uh, subway system in London. But now, what are we here for? To talk about games. So this is something completely different. Uh, I write insurance, banking, boring applications on a day-to-day -day basis. And I get joy out of them because of the complexity of dealing with JavaScript and CoffeeScript and all the server-side components that, that we can use in a Ruby on Rails application. But I also wanted to have an outlet for fun. And writing games typically takes you back down to the age of 10 when you're programming. So on the uh, App Store, paid apps, the ones that make money on the iPhone, 60% of them are games. On the iPad, 50% of them are games. So you can make money with this too while having fun, which seems to be a perfect combination. So let's talk a little bit about how do you make an iOS game. And there's a, a few patterns that I follow to basically learn and get introduced into this world. You can make them from scratch. You can use a iOS library called Core Animation, which is part of the, of the main ecosystem of iOS uh, development. You can get down to the bits and bytes and use something like OpenGL, or you can use a framework. So let's start by talking about doing it yourself. And this is how I started writing very simple iOS games. So when you do it yourself, you're basically using just the core Ruby Motion libraries. It's pretty good for simple games, things like board games, tile games, things like tic-tac-toe. Um, and what you're lacking is a game loop. In every game, there's a concept of a timeline that's moving. And you have to implement that timeline. And in that timeline, you check for things like, are the players doing something? Uh, it's the environment doing something that the players need to react to. So when you do it yourself, you have to implement all those things by hand. So the first demo that I have for you, it's a very simple Tetris clone that I uh, put together for you using just Ruby Motion. So on the screen, <laughs> Marco, I, I swear, I'm not a ventriloquist. <laughs> OK, so one of the things that I really like about building games with Ruby is that I can use the practices that I use, for example, in my Rails applications. I can create a model for the things that I'm building. In this example, I created a model for a board. And notice that it looks just like a typical Ruby class. There's nothing specific to uh, Ruby motion in here. I can ask my board whether a line of the Tetris game has been filled. And I'm losing the image here on the uh, secondary projector. Thank you. I can copy a line from one Y destination to another. Thank you. Turn off mirror. Command F1. Command okay. F1 toggles between. You need all need to know this. Command F1. Thank you. You're in business. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nick. The doctor's in the house. <laughs> so I can do things like add lines, remove lines. I can move the lines down. I can check if a line in my game is completely filled and remove it. But this is all pure Ruby code that I can test with RSpec or test unit. I don't really have to worry about uh, doing the visual testing as the only uh, way to catch errors. So I have a board, and I have a stone. 
And you can probably see from those matrices that uh, those are the pieces of a Tetris game. So I did the, the simplest possible implementation of a model that I could prove to work. Then I had to use very little Ruby motion code to actually glue it, glue it all together. And ideally, I wanted the game to be able to play with on-screen controls, but also with gestures, like swiping left, swiping right, two finger swipe moves the piece all the way to one edge, one finger swipe down, drops the piece down. And uh, this is a, a quick overview of the uh, Ruby motion code that I put together for that. Uh, it's actually fairly simplistic, uh, setting things like fonts and colors, and again, everything that was UI specific, the presentation layer, and part of the controller uh, of the game, it's built into this single class right now. I could probably break it into multiple pieces, but I didn't go that far. So, let me launch that demo so we can see a Ruby Motion game in action. This is the part where the demo gods might fail me. No, they haven't. Obviously, I can use gestures on my computer, so I'm going to use the built-in controls. And as you can see, I have a very simple Tetris game. Uh, all the logic of the game, it's pure Ruby, tested with RSpec, but uh, then I write a little bit of glue code to actually turn this into a iOS application. And it's much more fun to play it on the actual device. All right, enough of that. So that it is, that's what it's like to build an iOS game from scratch. Really follow the same patterns that you use for your Rails or Sinatra applications, separation of concerns. I have a model, I have a view and the controller kind of living in the same place. But other than that, it's follow the same practices that we follow every day. Good testing, uh, good refactoring, you know the story. So if you don't want to build everything from scratch, you have to get help from somewhere. And one of the libraries that can help you that it's a built-in iOS framework, it's Core Animation. Core Animation, it gives you a high-level uh, animation capabilities for UI views. And UI views are the main concept in a Ruby Motion application. In the case of the Tetris game, every tile that you saw there was actually a UI view. Rather than painting the pieces individually, I just created a grid of tiles on the whole screen, and I changed the colors of the tiles as the game progressed. So my gain loop, all it did was repaint the tiles that needed repainting. So it's very poor animation. You remember when you actually used to do cartoons on the edge of notebooks? That's kind of what I did in there, very, very low-level animation. With core animation, you can do 3D animations of 2D views. It's still not for performance-critical games like you know, first-person shooters and things of that sort, but it will give you at least some effects that will polish your application a little bit. So what I did to show you what core animation can do at a very minimal level, it's add a, an animation method when I remove a line from my Tetris game. So when one, one line is about to disappear, the tiles are going to flip and go away. And I did that with a single method that really takes a view as a parameter and flips it uh, along the vertical axis. And since I would have to actually be really good at the game to accomplish that, I also added that animation when you lose the game. So when you pile all the pieces and there's no more room for pieces to appear, then that animation will also uh, come into play. So let me run the version that has that animation in place. Oh, pie of death. You never know what's going to happen. And there it is. So the easiest way for me to actually show you that animation is to quickly lose the game. I notice that there's also a preview 
in the uh, top uh, left corner of the game, I did that with the same view, but just reducing the size of the little tiles that made it in a smaller board. So let's go ahead and lose this game quickly so you can see what core uh, Moj animation can do for you. So that, ta-da, little flip. But those are the little details that make a difference between a amateur game and a well-polished game. Obviously, this is not enough to release something like this to the App Store, but it's getting there. By the way, you can't release Tetris because there's a patent on Tetris that expires like in 2025 or something like that. All right, so let's talk about now the more complex stuff. So you see you can build games by hand. You can use core animation to do simple animations. Then you can also use OpenGL. In OpenGL, it's a low-level API for 2D, 3D graphics. If you use um, any low-level graphics API, you know how complex it can be. We're talking about basier curves. We're talking about shading, rendering, all the stages of complex graphics. You don't want to do that for the large variety of games. A large number of games don't require for you to get that low. So it is like doing it yourself, but with a very powerful graphics engine behind the scenes. Any Nirvana fans in the audience? No? <laughs> I had to crop something out of that picture just because I didn't know if it was going to be offensive. So. <laughs> All right. So frameworks. There are many, many choices out there. By far, the most popular seems to be Cocos 2D, which is open source. Um, and it is the framework that Joybox is based on. But there are an amazing number of frameworks appearing for a lot of different languages, including Java. Uh, Lua seems to be a very popular uh, language for game programming. I took a look at Lua. I'm not quite sold into how it feels, but it's, it's, it seems to be the forerunner of the game programming DSL languages. So let's talk about Cocos 2D. And Cocos 2D is what we can describe to you as sprites in a loop. And a sprite is just a character, an image, an image that you can animate, you can move around, you can do different things to it. And in Cocos 2D, we have a very simple movie-like paradigm. I, I said the word paradigm. Somebody should find me for that. But you have a director that directs the movie. You have scenes. Those scenes have layers. So layers are a basic graphic view of something that's happening in the game. And uh, they have a, a, a Z order. So the top level scene, it's what the user can see. And in those scenes, in, uh, sorry, in those layers, you have sprites. In the sprites, uh, you can do different things to them. There's also a library that allows you to now apply the laws of physics, but Newtonian physics, to those sprites. And the library that Joybox uses, it's called, uh, it's called uh, Box2D. In Box2D, it's a 2D physics engine. It allows you to give bodies things like density, elasticity, uh, so you can determine whether things will splash or bounce. Uh, so it's a, if you like playing with physics, it's a, it's a fun library to play with. And in this library, you have things like the world. And the world, for example, has a gravity parameter. Uh, you have shapes, you have bodies. Uh, bodies interact with other bodies and with fixtures. Fixtures are things that are fixed in place, like a mountain or a wall. And you have collisions. And collision detection is probably one of the hardest things to implement correctly if you were doing things by yourself. So Joybox. Joybox, it's Cocos 2D and Box 2D wrapped with Ruby Motion goodness to create an environment that allows you to build games in a way that I don't think that you see out there anymore. Uh, the, most of the code, if you go try to follow any game tutorial, the code is horrendous. It, is, it looks like COBOL programs in Objective-C in methods that are three miles long. And it's, that's one of the things that when I saw that, I'm like, no, I, I probably just can't jump into writing games. I, I can't do this after trying to cl build clean code over the years. So Joybox has brought that world into our world. So uh, Juan Caram, a fellow Latin programmer from Mexico City, after 10 Red Bulls and two failed relationships, created Joybox. Uh, he likes Cocos 2D. He likes Box 2D. He put them together and wrapped them with Ruby in a gem. So it's Cocos 2D, Box 2D, 
All the boilerplate of setting things up goes away, which is really nice. It's open source, and it's a very simple install. How simple, you ask? As simple as installing the gem and creating your project. You're done. That's the beauty of it. I tried to install Cocos 2D uh, before by hand, and I can't tell you how many times I have to re-image my Mac. <laughs> so Joybox. And what I want to show you to close this session is how to build a platformer game with Joybox. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm a business application developer. I write boring applications, applications that you have fun building, but you're not, you don't really want to use them because they're for like, you know, car insurance and, and things like banking and transfers and stuff like that. My kids, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't talk to me about this. Just writing that Tetris game, I never seen my 10-year-old so engaged by my work. He's like, what are you doing that now? So it's, it's really, really a fun environment. So let's talk about what a platformer game is quickly. It's a 2D game like Super Mario or Sonic. Uh, you can run, you can jump, you can collect things, uh, you can hit walls. Uh, the laws of gravity should apply to the game. And a camera follows you as you're playing. And the game uh, that I created, it's based on an existing tutorial. One of my goals was to prove that I can write cleaner Ruby code than the equivalent Objective-C code that was out there. So I found this tutorial, and I actually recreated it with Joybox. The difference is they wrote their own physics engine from the ground up. I'm not going to subject you to that. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. So what I'm doing instead is using Box2D, which is baked into Joybox to have physics, have Newton basically be my best friend with a few lines of code. And obviously, I'm using Ruby, which is a million times better than Objective-C. Flame war begin. So here's the plan. I'm going to create the game. I'm going to create the player. I'm going to add physics to the world. I'm going to implement the game loop. I'm going to create the interaction between the player and the world. Running and jumping will be added. We'll have the camera follow us. We kill the player, which is always the fun part. Death, it's always a fun thing to implement. And we'll add sound so I can really annoy you into going to launch. All right. So let's start the presentation with the basic Joybox application out of the box without anything in there. It, the only thing that I added here are the resources, so they're available already. So when you start Joybox, you basically get a blank screen and a few numbers, basically, how long it took to render the scene and the frames per second. So in, I'm doing 60 frames per second, which is a standard for most games of this kind. Nothing interesting there. Now, let's add the world. So one of the things that I want to show you before I jump into running that is that to create a world, you build something called a tile map. In a tile map, it's your world creation environment where you can create, uh, using images, a background for your game. And in the background, there will be some things that you can interact with and some other things that don't matter, things that are just background uh, images. For example, in this one, the mountains and the clouds are all background, but the green tiles are the floor. So the floor should stop the player from falling through. And notice in here that I have hazards, walls, and a background. And with this, this is an open source format to create tile maps. Most people creating 2D platformer games use something like this. It's the TMX uh, tile map format. So let me go ahead and close that. And now we can run our first real portion of the application. And what I'm doing in here, it's really loading the tile map. It's just a few lines of code. I'll show you how that happened in a second. But you can see now we have a, an iOS application with the background in place. If we look at the code, notice that I have one layer. And if you look at the equivalent code in Objective-C to load a tile map, you realize how awesome Joybox is. Two line, well, one line of code, really, in adding the tile map 
to the, C, to the layer, and that's it. That line of code did everything that we saw in there. So now let's move on to the next. So in the next check-in, I'm going to uh, create my uh, background layer. I'm going to skip that. The background layer was just the sky. I wanted a nice blue sky in there, so I'm going to skip that one. Then number four, I'm going to add my sprite. In this sprite, it's a physics sprite, uh, which I will go into what that means in a second. But so you have two types of sprites. You have sprites that are just images that you can move around, but there's no laws of physics applied to them. And then you have sprites that have the laws of physics applied to them. So you will ask why it's Koalio floating in space. Well, first of all, he has superpowers. But, <laughs> well, you can give him superpowers. In this world, you are God, which is the really cool thing, too. It feeds the ego of the developer. But the problem here is that there is no timeline running right now. There's no game loop. See? He should be falling right now, but we're seeing a snapshot in time at time zero because nothing is happening. So let me quickly show you the code that created Koalio. And that is everything that's needed for this. Notice that there's something called the world that I'm passing to build my sprite. And the world will have things like the gravity factors and other things like that. I also have the body of my sprite. And the body, in this case, is going to be a polygon fixture. So I'm creating a box that represents the actual thing that will follow the laws of physics. And the sprite image, it's overlay on top of that. And uh, Joybox does all that on my behalf. Notice that the image that I use for the player, it's that PNG file. OK. So now let me jump to the next portion. Oh, quickly here, I also did create the world. And I created the world with normal gravity, 9.8. All right, so let's add the game loop. In the game loop, again, it's, uh, I implemented that in my game loop method. In the game loop, really, it's a simple method that yields uh, a delta, which is the, the time increment. And all you need to tell the world is to step through that using that delta. So you can uh, implement things like fast forwarding time, slowing time down. You have control of time. So now that we have a game loop in place, let's see what happens to our friend Koalio. Ah! <laughs> There's gravity there now, but the floor, the floor, the floor, it's an illusion right now. It's just an image. We have to make the floor a real floor. So let's see how that is done. OK, so one of the things that I really like about uh, Joybox is that it gave me an insight into the abilities of Cocos 2D to debug things. So one of the things that I did in this next uh, commit is to really put everything in debug mode so I could see what was going on behind the scenes. Because my calculations for where the tiles and the fixtures should be was completely wrong. So I turned everything into a debug mode version of it so I could see every single tile, every single tile that I turn into a physics object, now visible. Now you can see that Koalio had stopped by the floor. It took me a little while to actually figure out the math to do this correctly, but I finally got it working correctly for the iPhone. And to do that debugging, all I really had to do is one line in my configuration of the director. Basically tell Joybox to debug the physics. And in my code, I did turn off all the graphical overlays on top of the uh, physical objects. So now let me switch back to everything visible. And now we should see our player with the real backgrounds 
dropping into a real scene and have the laws of physics apply to the player. And this is when I started getting excited. I'm like, whoa, physics, graphics, phone, this is awesome. All right, so let me show you the code that did the magic of basically catching that player. So for each one of the tiles in that tile set, I basically query the tiles that were walls. And for each one of those, I created a physical fixture that I could place into the world that could interact with the body of my player. And you can see that things have a specific density, have specific friction. I, I don't know what restitution means, so I'm going to look that up soon. <laughs> but I created fixtures for the walls, and I created fixtures uh, for the hazards. Because I have multiple layers in the tile map, I can query a tile for where it belongs and create the type of fixtures that I want to create. I also put them in instance variables that I can use later on. The walls I don't need later on. The hazards I do, because stepping on a hazard will kill Koalio. OK, so now it starts getting interesting, because now I added controls. And there's many different ways to add controls to a game. The way that I did it in here is touching on the left side of the screen allows you to jump. Touching on anywhere from the midpoint to the right allows you to run. So it's not very easy to play on the emulator. But as you can see, now I have jumping capabilities. But I also have flying capabilities because <laughs> you know what happened in there? I forgot that jumping only works when you have something underneath you. <laughs> so in my code, it's a very simplistic first try. I can jump in midair, and that allows me to fly. Also notice that he just went off the edge of the screen. Our world, our camera did not follow us. So Koalio is somewhere in Glasgow right now. <laughs> So I need to have a way for the camera or this virtual camera to follow my player. And I did that on the next step. Now let me quickly show you what that looks like. So that, uh, those simple six lines of Ruby code allows my viewpoint to center on the player. Now, the, uh, I actually took this code straight from Objective-C, but one of the things I want to pinpoint, too, it's the, the economy of expression. The Objective-C code was pretty chunky. And with Ruby, you get that beauty of cleaning things down, cooking them down to the point that you can see them and you understand them right away. Well, not two weeks later, but at least at that point in time. So now, with the viewpoint following the player, as we jump or fly and run, the camera will follow us. Every time I see that pie, I get sick to my stomach, because you never know if your machine is going to go and implode. All right, so we have the game now. And notice that I can jump, I can run, and the camera will follow us. And I can fly like Superman. I should probably give him more density or something. I don't know. <laughs> but notice that, uh, yeah, he's made out of like rubber. Oh, I, I miss landing on the wall. But the well will allow you to fall through, and the hazards should kill you, but they don't right now. So notice I can, I can bump into them, but I, they won't kill me. Ah. You know, you probably notice that I'm not a very good gamer. I can probably write the games, blah! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's see where we are with our game development. So now, the next thing I need to do is implement the collision detection. And I did that on step number eight. By the way, if you're a presenter and you're not using Git presenter, get on it. Uh, you can just move through your Git commits like it's a movie, too. Apt analogy here. 
Luckily for me, I placed the hazard right on the first scene so I can run right into it and die. <laughs> so as I move forward now, if I, oh, what happened? Did, did, did I miss it? Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That tells me you're a captive audience. All right, so now we should have collision detection with the hazards. All right, so let's run head first into that sucker. And you see that little shaking that happened in there? That effect, I got it for free from Joybox. Joybox has one method call to allow your player to do a little different things, shake, flip, melt into a pile of ashes, different things like that. So let me show you the code that actually accomplished that. That's it. I have a world variable. I can put a listener to it that says, when I, I, I collide with this player, it's going to pass, it's going to yield to me the sprite that the collision happened against. And I'm going to ask that, uh, that tile if it's part of the hazard style that I collected before. And if it did, you're dead. My die method basically sets my alive variable to false, and I run the action blink 50 times. That's it. So as you can see, game development greatly improved with Joybox. So now this is the part where I'm going to annoy you uh, because, well, I actually don't have sound plugged into the machine, or I might have but I will allow you to listen to some of the annoying music behind the game. Or whistling, either one. It sounds like elevator music, but the one that I really like <laughs> now, some of you that are classic gamers are going to hate me for this because you know this is wrong placement. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the last thing that I put together here, it's uh, implementing falling into the well, which it might be hard to demo because as you can see, I'm a very crappy gamer. If I had my 10-year-old here with me, he could probably get there in a second. But we'll give it a try, the all-college try. Now, for that, what I did is um, figure out when the Y position of my player was below zero. And if that happened, he's dead. And unfortunately, I can't turn the sound off anymore. Thank you. <laughs> you. You guys have no idea how surprised I am that that worked. <laughs> I also implement now a tap to retry, so I don't have to kill the application every time I want to play again. And let me show you how I did that, and then we can uh, have some questions and look at the code a little more. So in my uh, game layer, first of all, I have my director directing this movie. When the game is over, I say stop the animation, and I replace the scene with the game over layer, which has a scene built in into it. Now my game over layer, very simple. I have a retry label that says tap to retry. I have the blue sky background added to it too. And this is just pure uh, Ruby motion code. When the touch ended, I'm going to now replace the scene back to the game scene and restart the animation. On my sprite, dying now sets the alive variable to false, runs the action, and notice, uh, and actually I think we're working on figuring out ways to simplify how to add sounds. It should really be one keyword for us Rubyists. Huh? 
That is just way too much. So I played the effect hurt, and I stopped the background music. Notice uh, I have a question that I can ask the player. Are you above ground? If it's not above ground, I assume that he fell into the well. This will change if I add stairs or other type of uh, levels where he can actually uh, explore uh, vertically. So we went through our plan of how to build an iOS game with RubyMotion and Joybox. And I had a great time doing this. And I did it as a, as a presenter. They tell you, hey, you know, six months ahead of the conference, you have plenty of time to get things done. I did this in a weekend <laughs> because that's the way we work. We're developers. So you, too, can write games. If you write Rails applications, Sinatra applications, boring applications, you can do this on your spare time. It doesn't take much to learn it. And again, you can make good money out of it, too. If you have kids, they're the pe perfect beta testers. So I'm planning to start giving my son caffeine. I'm going to lock him in a room. And hey, I should be rich by this time next year. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much. All the code, it's available. Uh, so basically, do you have an App Store apps, games, written like that? I haven't released anything yet. I'm still in that fear factor stage where I'm thinking, oh, am I good enough to put a game out there? But I'm, I'm going to start with tile games, because the, the world of 2D games, it's pretty pretty populated right now. So I'm going to try to find an ancient game that people have forgotten about so I can actually recreate it with Joybox and put it out there in the App Store for free. I don't think I'm going to make money out of this for a while yet. Way out the back. So you, you simplified lots and lots of, uh, of, of the long, scary Objective-C stuff that we normally need to do. Have you got any plans to add, like, maybe parallax features and make that nice and simple for scrolling? Yes, so right now, I think there's uh, this library was just released. Joybox was released in May, I believe. So it is, it's, it's an infant. Uh, I imagine that there should be something like a Joybox-platformer library. I will be writing it. And that library should allow you to basically encapsulate some of the behaviors that you need to create a 2D game like this. Uh, yeah, parallax scrolling, actually, it's fairly simple with this, too. I mean, it's still a method that you have to write, so it should be a single call in passing an image and say, here's my background, parallax scroll that against my, my, uh, my uh, playing background. I, I quite liked how you, you went with uh, a Super Mario thing instead of the gorilla with bananas, like yes. your co-work, because yes. I was at the Ruby Motion conference, and uh, that's where you announced it. it was good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, down the bottom at the back. Um, how would I go about to, uh, to use hardware-specific things like a gravity sensor? So uh, Joybox doesn't care about that, but Ruby Motion has a lot of those controls in there for you. So the combination of the, of the two should allow you to at least get to the point that you can write maybe 10 lines of code to get it working. Uh, things like, for example, like single swipes, double swipes, uh, shaking the device, like I didn't show you this on the uh, Tetris game, but when you shake the device, you can rotate the piece, and that was two lines of code. So all those things are really built in into the platform. If you need to get to nitty-gritty details, you might have to break into uh, Ruby code right on top of the Objective-C classes. Please put your hands together for Brian. Thank you.